and welcome to our live stream on coronavirus. We're the Multiversity Project, and today we have on a special guest, Yage from Toronto, who is going to be talking to us about um, the, the, the biological realities of the coronavirus. Yage is a student of cellular and molecular biology, as well as a mystic and a jeweler. And he's got some pretty interesting opinions and knowledge about these kinds of viruses. So welcome to the show, Yage. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's an honor. Cool, cool. Yeah, thanks for coming. Yeah, so, so why don't we start off with the basics? Like, what is the coronavirus? So uh, the coronavirus, or, or more accurately, coronaviruses in general, this is actually a, a large group of viruses. Uh, the COVID-19 that we're currently dealing with is really just one coronavirus. But the group that the coronavirus belongs to, coronaviridae, is a very, very large group of viruses. Uh, it's related to certain viruses that are sometimes found in fish, sometimes called the bifinivirus, or certain viruses that are found in shrimp, like the ronavirus. Uh, and it belongs to an even larger group of viruses called the nidoviralis, which refers to the way in which its RNA is actually replicated in a, in a nested fashion, nido meaning nested. And this group of viruses, uh, coronaviridae, is actually ever present in the human population. It's something people deal with all the time. And there's a very good chance that uh, yourselves and most of the people watching this have actually at one point been infected with the coronavirus and this sort of manifests as a cold, a very, very serious cold. Hmm. So, so in your video, you were talking about like coronaviruses are kind of defined by the shape of the virus. Do you want to maybe touch on that a bit? Yeah, so uh, the name coronavirus uh, comes from the way that the virus actually appears when looked at under a microscope. Uh, the spiked envelope proteins that are on the outside of the coronavirus are quite large and quite numerous. And so when looking at the virions under a microscope, there appears to be this, uh, this fringe or crown or, or corona around the, the particle itself. And this is actually where the name derives. Much in the same way, like the beer Corona, I believe has something to do with crowns. Right. Got it. So when you say that, like, it's likely that we've all been infected with some kind of coronavirus, does that just mean that we've all probably had a cold that was a virus that had this shape? Or does that mean that like that cold is actually related to this coronavirus somehow? So the relation between those colds and the current coronavirus outbreak would be somewhat distant uh, in terms of the genetic relations but it would have been one of these viruses that has this corona around it. Uh, when we look at uh, what we refer to as the common cold, about half or more cases of the common cold caused by rhinoviruses. This is a term some people may have heard before, uh, rhino meaning nose. But uh, about 30% of the time that somebody gets a cold, uh, it could be a coronavirus. And then there's a variety of other viruses that make up the other 20% of common colds. Interestingly enough, when these colds tend to infect us, they're often a little bit more severe than the average sort of sniffles, and people will frequently misidentify what they're dealing with as having the flu, um, mm. merely because you know they feel achy, or maybe they have a little gastrointestinal upset, or they have a fever, or something like that. But this is not to be confused with the influenza virus, which is in fact much more serious. Okay, so, so the corona, even though it's not necessarily based on a genetic similarity in all cases, it does carry certain properties with it. Yeah, it, it, and uh, we, we sort of, we really group these things by their protein structure and by the structure of their genome. So the current coronavirus outbreak, like all coronaviruses, has a single-stranded positive sense RNA genome, and it's in one piece inside of that virus particle. And so if you were to be infected with a common coronavirus, it's likely a very distant relative to the coronavirus from Wuhan, but it would share all of these similarities in its protein structure and the way in which its genome is actually organized. Okay, so what's kind of unique about this coronavirus from Wuhan? So the thing that's really unique about this coronavirus from Wuhan uh, is uh, it's quite similar if, if one was to look at what makes the SARS virus a SARS virus. Uh, so the SARS virus was another coronavirus outbreak that, um, I mean, for, for Canadians, we'll all be quite familiar with it. 
Uh, it was quite a big deal back in 2003. Uh, the Chinese people will be familiar with it. It was a very big deal for them. That's where it came from. Uh, but the thing that really uh, sets it apart is that there is this genetic difference. And so even though the general organization and structure of the proteins might be very similar, there are very likely, if not certainly, differences in key amino acid residues in those proteins that are making it very difficult for our immune system to recognize. And this is sort of why it's capable of producing a much more severe version of the respiratory symptoms that you get from a coronavirus that causes the cold because your immune system is not able to recognize it. And so the immune reaction is severely delayed and gives time for real havoc to be wreaked upon the respiratory system. Yeah, yeah, I found that to be one of the most interesting parts of your video where you're talking about um, what makes this virus so particularly dangerous. So it sounds like you're sort of identifying two things. Like one is that it's got these unusual markers that make it hard for our antibodies to really recognize it. And the other one is the long incubation period. Is that accurate? Yeah, the, uh, the long incubation period is definitely uh, something that is a real problem. And uh, I would not necessarily be able to identify exactly why the incubation period is so long. Uh, this can be related to these proteins on the surface of the virus that have changed, but they can also simply just be a result of the biochemical replication of the virus inside the body. So incubation period is the time in which it takes to see symptoms of a disease and, and, uh, and really actually recognize that you're sick. Uh, when people get infected with the cold or even with the flu, this usually happens in a few days. But uh, with the coronavirus, this period is very, very long. And the real danger with the long incubation period is that it allows for many, many people to potentially be exposed to a carrier before anybody realizes that it's probably a good idea to not get around that person. Gotcha. Yeah. So, uh, how, how is this virus spread? So the coronavirus is spread primarily through respiratory droplets. So when you speak or you sneeze or you cough or any of that kind of stuff, little bits of moisture that are coming out of the respiratory system can go off into the air. Uh, as far as we know, it doesn't transmit through aerosols, which are small actual pieces of dust that might come out carrying the virus. Uh, this is a very, very good thing because it really limits how far the virus is able to go and how long it's able to hang around. But a lot of people don't necessarily think about the actual distance that a respiratory droplet can travel, uh, even just from, from a simple cough. You can sometimes get a good distance of a few meters between yourself and where those respiratory droplets actually land. So this is what makes being in a very confined space with poor air ventilation uh, quite dangerous for transmitting any disease that carries on respiratory droplets. Because even if you don't completely cover your nose or your mouth, even if you get most of it, but a little bit gets by, that little bit can still go pretty far and then either land on a surface where somebody puts their hand or potentially even go directly onto someone's skin and then they touch their hand onto it or in extreme cases actually go directly into the openings of somebody's body. Wow. Hmm. Can it live for a pretty long time on surfaces or on people's skin? So the current understanding um, with the virus, and uh, I'll, I'll preface this by saying that th this is where our understanding is probably developing the most rapidly. There could have very well been things that have been published in the last 24 hours that say otherwise, or that are about to be published that say otherwise. But there's at least a good two hour period if that virus lands on a copper or a steel surface where it's very likely to still survive. If it lands on a porous surface like a cloth or a piece of cardboard or something like that, it could very well be longer, especially if there are other cells present, like bacteria and other microbes that are capable of being infected and carrying that virus. In the case of human skin, it's likely the same case in that it could probably survive there for a very long time because of the nature of uh, the various microbes and, and gunk that are sitting on our skin at all times. So is a very long time like um like a day or a week or something like that? Uh, a very long time could be, yeah, you know, a few days, if not a week or two. Oh, wow. We are not entirely sure what that time frame is when we talk about these uh, sort of organic or porous surfaces. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting. I guess on the topic of other creatures getting infected with, with coronavirus, uh, is, you know, the, the, 
It seems like the mainstream story is that coronavirus came from an animal source, likely bats. But some people are speculating that it might have been uh, man-made or like an accidentally released bioweapon. Uh, I was wondering if you could address that controversy. Well, uh, the first thing I would bring up is the question of bats. Um, the, the reason why we do think that it came from bats specifically is because a strain of coronavirus, this would be a, a member of this, this large group that we discussed before that you know can cause colds. This is one of these distant relatives to a human cold causing corona that made its way into mammals and was hanging around in there and mutating and, and evolving uh, around in there. We found one of these strains in a species of bat that is actually native to Wuhan and other parts of China that shares uh, probably the highest genetic similarity between itself and the current coronavirus outbreak, which is why we believe that this is likely where it came from. Uh, the genetic similarity, however, is somewhat distant, so we're not exactly sure where the divergence from what we found happened. Um, there's still a little bit of speculation about how recently that genetic evolution happened. But in regards to the concerns about it being man-made, um, I will first say that just because something happens at a time of political unrest in a place where there's political unrest does not mean that it is a man-made weapon. That is uh, what a lot of people are pointing to. The, the other thing I will say to that is, um, if you were trying to create a bioweapon, why would you release it in your own country and then shut down all of your economy as a result of it being there with no working vaccine? That simply does not make sense. I mean, to be it's classified as a bioweapon, it needs to have uh, the potential to actually be turned on and off. That's how we, that's how we define bioweapons. So right. the idea that this was man-made would really only make sense if there was also clearly some controlled uh, distribution of the virus and, and weird dispersion of immunity among people, which we're simply just not seeing. So it could be an, an accidentally released bioweapon though, right? Well, people are speculating about it that as well, right? Because of the, the lab that's present in Wuhan where they were doing this kind of research and everything. And I, I will admit the possibility for accidental release of biological threats is true. That is possible. However, uh, there are a series of biosafety levels, bio, you know, one, two, three, four, that exist for containing and handling these types of problems. Uh, if this was some sort of accidental release, it's also very likely that we would have seen numerous other accidental releases as a result of faulty uh, biocontainment levels. Uh, the fact that this is just one means that that's quite unlikely. Uh, at the same time, what is perhaps a little bit more likely is that the accidental release happened because somebody working with it became infected and then it mutated it within them and then they transmitted it to other people. But the patient zero that we have and the patient zeros that we've identified uh, in various parts of the world don't point to that, even though it is possible. So again, the chances of that being the case are extremely unlikely. Do you agree with the, the idea that um the evidence we have, like the patient zeros that we have point to it being an issue of people eating bats or? Now, I'm not entirely sure uh, what the practices are in China with bats in particular, uh, or really any animal in particular, other than, you know, many people around the world are aware that it is common to be in close contact with live animals of various different kinds, very often taken from the wild and then put into captivity, captivity and sold from person to person while they're still alive. So whether or not somebody ate a bat or they came in contact with a bat who was sick and who was coughing or bleeding or whatever it was, or perhaps the bat was there and transmitted the virus to another animal of some kind, and then that animal was the one that was then uh, uh, responsible for the exposure to humans. Uh, it, yeah. it's, it's all really a lot of speculation. It's really difficult to understand uh, what's going on with, without physically being there and having a really good idea of what the culture and practices are around that. However, what I can say confidently is that uh, the suspicion that it came from seafood or a seafood market, as was early, uh, has definitely been found to be false. Uh, we believe that it was likely brought there, again, probably from some other live animal or perhaps by a human who was already infected. Okay. Cool, okay. Thanks. Yeah, thank you.
how would you say this virus compares to SARS and MERS, like in level of severity? Uh, well, when we talk, when we look at SARS and MERS, if we just think about the fatality rate, uh, the fatality rate for SARS was close to 10%. So if you were to become infected with the SARS virus, there was about a one in 10 chance that you would likely die from that infection. But what we're currently seeing with the coronavirus is I believe a little bit closer to 3%. So although the, uh, the infection has spread very, very, very rapidly through various parts of the world, the majority of people who are being infected with it are surviving without much difficulty. It seems as though the people who are most at risk are people who are over the age of 70. Uh, even, even very, very small children, like we would normally think would be at risk for this type of infection as well. The few infants that have been infected with the disease actually haven't shown many issues uh, from said infection. And when we look at MERS, I don't have uh, very good access to the exact numbers on that, but from what I understand, it was of similar or lower severity than the SARS virus. I, I think it was actually, I, I think it was actually a lot deadly. worse. Yeah, I think it was like a, like a, like a 30% death rate or something like that. Um, but 30. But yeah, yeah that's, that was really high. that's what I read. <laughs> That's what I read, but I don't think it spread very far. Yeah, it was pretty contained, yeah. Uh, uh, again, I, I don't have access to the exact numbers for that, so it could very well have actually been quite that severe, but uh, the point that you made about it not spreading very far, I do know about that. And, and this is also the reason why many people in the West are actually unaware that, that it even happened. Yeah, um, maybe we could stick with SARS as a reference point because I think that's more commonly known to our audience. Um, do you, do you have the numbers like in your head enough to kind of put into context for us, like how big this possible pandemic is compared to the, scar, the SARS scare in 2002? Uh, I don't have the exact number. Uh, I can get you the exact number quite quickly for what the current uh, situation is with the coronavirus, but I cannot actually remember the exact number for SARS. Okay. Yeah, I think SARS is actually a really good reference. I was looking at um, Wikipedia, and I think the WHO started calling this this new coronavirus SARS-2. Mm. Um, mm. uh, yes, and th that is actually how um, many scientists in, in the virology sphere are, are referring to it, because um, just the similarity uh, in symptoms and also where it came from and the way it's spreading. What, what are now, the symptoms? Uh, oh. Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. Go, go ahead. I interrupted you. I think you're about to give us some data. Yeah, I was going to say, so the, uh, the current number for uh, coronavirus in the world as of today is uh, 98,088 confirmed cases, 3,356 deaths. So yeah, a little bit more than 3%. Okay, so that, that's... 54,000 of those people that have been infected have been recovered. Okay, actually, I wanted to ask, ask you something about that. I, I heard that people were, were catching it again after, after recovering, um, and that it was, um, it was like worse the second time. Have you heard about that? Uh, I actually have not. Um, I would be a little surprised if it was the exact same virus. There, there are a number of biological and molecular mechanisms that could explain why that would happen that would potentially involve some sort of uh, rapid mutation of the virus or, um, you know, potentially certain drugs that people are trying to, to treat themselves with maybe weakening the immune system. Yeah. But, I think uh, that was this scary. would be news to me. Yeah. I, I just wanted to pull up that number real quick because I, I do think that this is good context. Um, right now, the coronavirus we're dealing with around 98,000 cases, 3,000 3, something deaths, um, SARS in 2002 was 8,437 cases and 813 deaths. So you were right, it was a higher fatality rate, but we're at over 10 times the amount of confirmed cases as ever happened in SARS. Yeah. Yeah, the, the infectivity is the thing that I think makes this virus very, very scary to people. Um, and uh, again, I believe that is largely in part uh, because of this very long incubation period that we're seeing. Is it, I mean, I'm wondering, like, just based on your video, like you were talking about how this virus is like a very unusual structure in part because it has like this, you know, it comes from an animal. So there's all these elements of it that are unusual in human viruses, if I understood correctly. 
Well, that's, uh, that's the leading theory is that because it came from an animal, this would be the reason why it had the ability to develop all these uh, elements that were not um, known by the human immune system. In general, this is how we understand zoonotic diseases to occur. So, you know, any, any flu epidemic that you've ever heard of, the bird flu or the, 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 you know, the H3N2 or the H1N1 swine flus, uh, is very much the same sort of idea in that because it's in an animal, uh, it has all these things in it that we haven't seen, but it merely needs to acquire something that allows it to attach to our cells and infect us in order for all of those new animal problems to get into a human cell and start wreaking havoc inside of us. I mean, could that be why our like adaptive immune system is having such a hard time? Like, could that be why there's a recurring cases? Cause it's just such a weird, just weirdly shaped thing. That, that could be part of it. And, and as I mentioned uh, just moments ago, you know, if there was, if there was a very, very rapid mutation of this virus in humans, uh, which, who knows, could very well be the case since there have been so many people infected over uh, such a vast swath of land that if it takes, uh, you know, a little bit of change in some of those coat proteins to now suddenly no longer be recognized, but still be infective to humans, then that could be the reason why it's capable of reinfecting people is that it might get back into the body and it's more or less the same virus, but the one place on the virus that our immune system was recognizing and attaching antibodies to maybe has just changed again and no longer is able to be recognized. Is, is the fact that it's, um, it's, it's infected so many different people, uh, does that make it more likely that it's gonna mutate and keep infecting people just because it's in more places? Generally speaking, uh, you sort of are on the right track. The more reservoirs uh, that the virus has to spend time in and be exposed to various other, you know, other viruses or other environmental conditions, the more opportunity it does have to make changes. Could you explain that a little bit, um, like what happens when viruses are exposed to other viruses? Are they able to like mix with one another somehow and mutate faster? Or? So it's not always uh, easy for that to happen just because other viruses are present. But if those viruses share genetic similarity with the virus in question, so uh, what's, what's potentially going on in, in the case of a rapid mutation uh, is that A, it could just be that there's some mistakes made while the RNA is replicating, or B, maybe there are other coronaviruses present. Maybe there are human coronaviruses that cause colds that are present in somebody already. They might not even have symptoms to this because it's possible to carry a number of viruses at any given point in time and never be sick. This is why it's possible for someone who seems healthy to actually give a cold to somebody who was prior to that healthy and nobody really knows where it came from is that it merely was uh, sort of hiding in, in the original person. Now, if one of these viruses is present and the Wuhan virus gets in there, and for whatever reason, because of the immune system attacking or because of the chemical composition of that person's body, uh, there is damage to the DNA of the coronavirus at the same time that this other virus is getting damaged. And maybe inside of a small number of that person's cells, there's little fragments of the RNA sort of floating around. Um, in rare cases, these can recombine in new combinations that are different from the way that they actually showed up. You could maybe get, you know, a large portion of your genome is Wuhan virus, and then a little bit of human corona kind of attaches on to a broken end because both of these pieces of RNA are, are broken inside of that cell. Uh, this can sometimes happen, and this would be one way of explaining how a very rapid mutation can occur, and more importantly, how a mutation can occur that allows this virus to evade the immune system while still retaining its human infectivity. Wow, that's, that, that's almost like, uh, like sexual reproduction <laughs> for viruses. That's a funny way of looking at it. I, I, that, that's kind of one way of thinking about it, you know, if we wanna, if we wanna throw yeah, out the technicalities. <laughs> <laughs> accidental virus sexual reproduction. <laughs> accidental virus sexual reproduction, yeah. And, and this is uh, very similar, to, for example, to how the flu virus actually is capable of mutating so incredibly fast. 
why we see new flu pandemics and why it's necessary to get a yearly flu shot. The major difference being that the flu has eight different pieces of RNA in its genome. So it's extremely easy for it to mix and match those without the need for those pieces of RNA to actually break. Oh, okay. Right. That's really interesting. I, I guess how does the coronavirus compare to the flu like overall? Like I've heard a lot of people making comparisons between them. but Well, the best thing to really think about is just looking at uh, the lethality of it. The lethality of the flu, although uh, percentage wise is quite low, the fact that it mutates so fast and that it is endemic, meaning that it's ever present and never goes away in our population, uh, arguably makes the flu as dangerous, if not a little bit more dangerous than the coronavirus. Just, just in and of itself for that reason. I believe um, in the 2019, 2020 flu season, and I know these numbers have gone up, but as of about a week or two ago, I think there were already close to 16,000 deaths uh, in the United States alone from influenza. Now, oh. that is a very small percentage of how many people get it, but the fact of the matter is that's an incredible amount of people that are dying from this virus. Right. Yeah, well, what do you think, Imagining a world where this coronavirus was as widespread as the flu, how would you compare the dangers then? Or is it too soon to say? It's a little bit too soon to say, uh, particularly since we're still in the process of developing effective vaccines. Uh, you know, in the case of the flu virus, we already sort of have a protocol in place for, for doing our vaccination and immunization. Uh, and I, I think it would be good to, to really wait and see how effective our new immunization techniques are at fighting off this virus. But if we sort of for the point of rhetoric, imagine a world where the Corona Wuhan, the Wuhan coronavirus is, is present and is endemic all over the place, uh, it would potentially become the same sort of concern as the influenza virus, which that being said, although dangerous, many people are not that concerned about. Could it, would it like likely be easier to vac to create a vaccine for the coronavirus that was more comprehensive because its genome is so much simpler? Uh, yeah, and the the very first test vaccines were were shipped out um, quite a while ago, I think almost a month ago, and and are in the process of being tested. Uh, that is completely unprecedented for any virus, uh, even one with a simple genome, because I believe it only took. I think it was 45-ish days after getting the sequence of the coronavirus genome before being able to develop this first version of the vaccine. So yes, our ability to develop vaccines for it is likely going to be much, much faster and more effective than when we try to develop something for the flu. But at the same time, there is no currently effective vaccine that has made it through that testing. It's still in its preliminary stages, and there is a chance that that first version might not work. I guess this is kind of going back to some of the more conspiratorial ideas about the coronavirus, but that, that point that you just brought up that there was a test vaccine so quickly is something that is like peaking a bunch of red flags for people like, oh, they knew about it before and they released it on purpose. Like, do you see the fact that this vaccine was developed so quickly as suspicious in any kind of way, or does it seem reasonable, like based on how technologically advanced that we are and how close this virus is to other forms of coronavirus that we know that a vaccine could have been developed that quickly? Uh, I believe it is the latter. I believe it's actually really uh, indicative of how advanced our biomedical technology has gotten. Uh, the thing to know about this first version of the coronavirus vaccine that is being tested is that it, it does not operate the way a normal vaccine does in which you're given little protein bits of a dead virus, or in some cases being given a live attenuated virus particle. The way that I believe this vaccine has been developed is actually by um, giving the patient or, or, or the, uh, the organism a collection of pieces of the coronavirus RNA, such that your body is able to uh, sort of use its various uh, immune processes to produce and then identify what these proteins are and then add that to its repertoire of known antigens that it needs to attack. Mm -hmm. And this is a new technique, one that we really have only been able to do within the last 
you know, five or 10 years, if not less, because of the incredible advancements that have happened in genome sequencing and this type of genetic technology. Well, and I'd say that's even more amazing, given that, uh, as you said earlier, the coronavirus seems to evade people's immune systems. So making a, giving, giving bits of the virus um, that somehow the immune system is able to recognize and attack seems kind of, uh, yeah, seems kind of difficult given that situation. It is. And that's why I say, you know, we're not entirely sure whether or not this current version is going to work because it does sort of befall the same difficulties as even just a, a regular dead, you know, protein filled vaccine might, which is that although we're speeding up the process by uh, administering RNA and genetic information instead of proteins, the real trick is identifying which pieces of RNA and the proteins that they correspond to that are going to be the right ones for getting the immune system to really kick itself into gear. So it could potentially be that the genetic information that was selected and put into this current vaccine might not be the ones that our body's able to recognize it very well, or potentially that maybe some people's bodies are able to pick that up and, and fight it off and that other people's can't. We don't really know at this point in time. So is the idea that like our immune system is going to like, uh, like like latch on to the RNA specifically instead of the proteins in this case in the case of this vaccine now one might think that that's the case and uh, you know there's a little bit of evidence with immunology to suggest that that's possible but the real mechanism that uh, it, the the scientists behind this magazine uh, vaccine is really hoping is going to, to really get this thing to work is that the body is actually going to translate pieces of those RNA independently, you know, not in a, an environment where all of the right ones are present at the same time, which would then thereby allow for uh, a virus particle to actually assemble and get out of the cell and continue replicating, but that the body will just produce a very small amount of these proteins and that right away when your body does this, it recognizes that that's something new that isn't supposed to be there and then kind of goes and latches on to it. So the protein element is still present, but it helps speed up the process and potentially get your body to recognize it faster by giving your body a little bit of RNA instead of just protein. Okay, interesting. Do you think it's pretty likely that being said that, I mean, even if this vaccine doesn't work, do you think it's pretty likely that this virus could be cured pretty quickly? Uh, it well, I just have to ask, what exactly do you mean by cured? Well, a vaccine that works for a large enough percentage of people that it would stop the rapid spread of the virus. So, as you, as you asked, even if this one doesn't work, um, is, there, is there a way that we can kind of figure that out and achieve herd immunity? I do think that's possible. I very much think that's possible. Uh, surely because it took us such a short period of time to even get to this first step, if it does not work, uh, we're, we have made some leeway, and it's really a matter of sort of tweaking things around until we hit that right target. Now, at the same time, there is a little bit of testing being done using antiviral drugs that were used to treat Ebola. And initial evidence doesn't tell us that they're going to treat the coronavirus completely, but that at the very least, they will slow down its ability to replicate and spread. And in and of itself, having a drug like that available will also very much reduce the rate of infection that we're seeing. So it's sort of a, a two-spear or a two-pronged approach that mm -hmm. the CDC and the National Institute of Health uh, and various other organizations are really going at right now. And I think between those two, we're very likely to find a way to uh, sort of, if not achieve herd immunity, at least stop the virus from spreading any further than it already has. Okay. What do you think about the hypothesis? Um, some people have brought up that the coronavirus might not be able to survive in really hot and humid weather. Now, uh, I have heard a little bit of discussion about this. Like a lot of people are really uh, sort of hoping that, you know, like the spring and the summer is going to come around and that's really going to like kill the virus off. Yeah. There isn't actually much evidence to suggest that that's going to be the case. Uh, we see cases of various human coronaviruses and influenza viruses and things like that throughout the year, uh, even when it's not cold. The thing that really helps slow down the spread of a virus in that period of time is not necessarily the humidity or the heat or any of that. 
uh, as these things could actually potentially just make it easier for respiratory droplets to move around. But uh, the fact that people are spending less time in small confined spaces during the hot months is the big thing. And this goes for all diseases. This is why cold and flu season is cold and flu season is because people are cold and so they go inside and they don't want to go outside. You know, they get in the subway, they're getting on buses with each other. Uh, and when you're in very, very close contact with other human beings, you're just asking for pathogens to spread around. Interesting. Okay. So I wanted to, I wanted to ask, um, so I guess, um, so we, we were comparing it to the, the, the coronavirus to the flu earlier. Um, I, I don't, I was, I was curious about the symptoms. I think the flu usually, um, people usually progresses to something like pneumonia maybe, and, and this one's severe acute respiratory syndrome. So there's some respiratory stuff going on. Can you, can you just talk about the symptoms and how somebody might die from this? So in the case of the flu, uh, the flu often presents with a wide range of symptoms. You know, you might have a little bit of respiratory distress, uh, upper or lower, uh, which in some severe cases might cause pneumonia. Uh, you have gastrointestinal distress and things like that that can result from the flu. This is very, very common. Uh, aches and pains, all this kind of stuff is very, very, very common. When we talk about the coronavirus, it's actually possible for the coronavirus to cause pneumonia. And this is often why people need hospitalization or in some cases might die is because the virus reaches their lower respiratory tract and, and they get fluid inside of the lungs and effectively, you know, uh, get very difficult time breathing. Uh, hmm. But when we talk about the coronavirus, the most common symptoms are things like fever, uh, coughing, difficulty breathing, sort of, you know, sign of some sort of infection and sign of lower respiratory tract infection with there is a potential for some of the other symptoms of the flu to arise, but they're definitely less common. And the thing that, uh, as I said, makes the coronavirus so deadly is that it really does go for the respiratory tract and has a very high probability of getting into the lower respiratory tract, which in the case of the flu, although possible, is less common. Okay, I see. Thanks. So, so you kind of touched on this earlier, but how likely do you think it is that this virus reaches a level where it changes daily life for most people in a significant way? I think that that potential is quite low, um, not only because of the containment measures that are currently being enacted uh, in, in various places of the globe and in all the various health measures that have been put into place, but also because, as I mentioned, if you're, if you're a young person, even if, even if you're middle-aged, there just really is not that high of a chance of you really even requiring hospitalization and in the event that you do, you are still probably going to survive. So unless this becomes the kind of thing where, you know, walking down the street and, and brushing up against the wrong street pole and then going like this gives you a high probability of getting the virus on a daily basis, I don't think it's going to have much effect on the way that people live, you know, in comparison to things like the common cold or the flu. I mean, I guess I'm also wondering, like, if it, like, given, like, the high risk of this, like, lower respiratory tract, um, uh, sim these lower respiratory tract symptoms, like, is there any possibility of, like, even among survivors, maybe, like, the body being damaged in some way? Now, I have yet to see a lot of literature about that. Um, my, my inclination is that in the case of the healthy people who are, who are recovering from the virus and are getting past it, that that's not the case. But if you are maybe one of these 70 or 80 year olds who gets the virus but survives it, there could potentially be lasting problems, not necessarily from the virus itself, but actually as a consequence of the severe inflammatory response and, and immune reaction that you get as that in and of itself has the potential to uh, cause damage to some of the tissues that it happens in. Well, interesting. Mm -hmm. And you seem to be kind of, I don't know if I want to say downplaying, but like not so concerned about it because the death rate is like relatively low compared to SARS or, or MERS. But to me, three per, a 3% death rate does seem like a fairly high number. Like I'm trying to imagine a world where, I don't know, let's say, I mean, if half the people were getting this virus every year and 3% of them were dying, that's like one in a hundred people dying every single year. It seems like it would be a pretty severe situation. Like, 
Well, well, what is the death rate of the flu, for example? Not not how many people die in the U.S., but like the percentage of people who are infected who die. I believe the influenza death rate is significantly lower, uh, just by percentage than uh, that of the coronavirus. Uh, I'm going to double check the numbers, but I think it's uh, I think it's less than one percent. So. Um, the, the concern for, you know, if everybody in the planet was to get infected, would a large number of people die? Yes, that is true. But, uh, the important thing to remember in that case, uh, and, and part of why, you know, I'm not really expressing too much concern is that being concerned, being afraid, being hysterical is actually the other part of a pandemic that is so dangerous because people tend to make irrational decisions, uh, but, you know, potentially do things in a way that's a little bit different or that might not just be the best for them to you know, maintain their own health and the health of those around them. So as long as everybody is able to really do their part and be wary of what's going on, uh, report anything that they see, keep themselves healthy, rest, stay hydrated, uh, then although a threat shouldn't necessarily be a heavy concern, just like any other illness that one can befall and die from. What, what do you mean by doing your part? What would doing your part be in this situation? So uh, doing your part would definitely be not, uh, you know, making sure not to, to cough out into the open, making sure to be, you know, good hygiene, washing the hands, cleaning the food, uh, keeping yourself rested, keeping yourself hydrated, uh, making sure to be wary of any potential signs of infection. And if you know somebody who is potentially infected, then there is an additional precaution that needs to be taken. This is one of the cases where actually having a mask could be beneficial. Now, people are wearing masks right now because they believe it's going to help them, you know, stay not infected and you know, if they're using a regular surgical mask, that isn't necessarily the case, but that doesn't negate the value that wearing one of those masks might actually have in protecting all of those around you. So if you're in an area where you know eight or nine or 10 cases or something like that have been, have been found and have been confirmed, uh, wearing a mask over your face could actually be a key component in doing your part to help uh, contain this virus. Because it means that if you were accidentally exposed to one of these people in that 12 day period while they were incubating and the virus is now in you, you're a lot less likely to spread your respiratory droplets around and then give it off to other people. So are you saying that a mask wouldn't necessarily protect you from getting infected with the virus, but if you had it, it would protect you from spreading it? Uh, when we talk about the common surgical masks, uh, you know, the ones that are blue or white or whatever, the little cloth ones, uh, that is very much the case. They're not actually designed to prevent things from going into the body. Uh, they don't do very well at that because of, because of their open sides and the ability for things to kind of like flow in there. But they are designed to actually prevent things from coming out of the body. You know, high velocity respiratory droplets that come out when you speak or you sneeze or you cough would very rapidly hit that and, and be absorbed and stay in that little piece of cloth on your face. And this is why doctors and dentists and all these various medical professionals actually wear them when performing medical procedures is not so much to protect themselves, but actually to protect the patient that they're operating on. Right, that makes sense. Okay, are there masks that would be effective, uh, effective um, for protecting yourself against the virus? Uh, yes, um, I, I can't remember the exact name of the model, but it's it's the N N ninety something or da 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 is like the one that a lot of people are buying right now. And there there are a number of other um, uh, models of these masks as well that actually have respirators in them that actually have something that's designed to filter the incoming air. Oh, wow. So wearing a mask like that will in fact protect you from droplets in the air if you get a really really good one, but uh, regular medical masks do not. I see. What do you think about like, uh, I know a lot of people who are like stocking up on like canned goods and water and stuff like that. Do you think there's any um, wisdom to that course of action? Absolutely. Uh, there are some people that are doing it, I believe, because they're afraid that all hell is going to break loose and uh, oh my God, it's a pandemic. <laughs> and this kind of gets at the, the point I made about the danger of hysteria. But 
doing this could still be very, very wise, uh, simply because if you happen to get sick and you need to isolate yourself or quarantine yourself, or let's say that some sort of curfew or, or large quarantine is enacted over the place that you're living, you will need a large store of food in your home because uh, you're not really going to be able to necessarily access it, especially if you're someone who's under quarantine and is not allowed to leave the home whatsoever. And at that point, if you don't have food, if you don't have clean water and all that kind of stuff, you will only make yourself sicker. And that is where the potential to, uh, you know, need hospitalization or spread to other people becomes worse. Is there anything um, you'd recommend people stock on other than food and water? Uh, I would definitely recommend that people also stock up on various basic medical supplies uh, for similar reasons, uh, because you might not have access to it. But the really key ones in there are to get the uh, anti-inflammatories that one might actually need to take if infected with a severe cold or with the coronavirus, because that will be a really key part in helping to mitigate the severity of the illness and, uh, again, help your body fight it off and potentially prevent further spread to other people. What would be an example of that kind of anti-inflammatory? So ibuprofen is the one that most people are familiar with. You know, they call it by the brand name Advil, um, but, but any brand of ibuprofen would be good. If you're in an area where naproxen is available to you, you know, it's commonly known by the brand name Aleve. That's another really good thing to go for. And depending on who you are, there's a number of herbal anti-inflammatory products that you might want to get yourself, get, get your hands on. Uh, having lots of turmeric around and eating lots of turmeric in your diet is really good for that. Um, drinking chamomile tea when you're sick, for example, there's, a, there's evidence there that there's some anti-inflammatory properties. And the list really can become quite endless if you do digging, but anything in that sort of category. Okay. Are you, like, are you concerned about this to the level, share if you feel comfortable, but that you would person, that you're personally prepping, preparing with extra food and water? Uh, because I live in Toronto and uh, at the current point in time, the highest density of infected cases in Canada is, I believe, uh, Toronto and uh, I want to say Vancouver, but I know it's British Columbia. Um, I do, I do have, an, you know, enough sort of wariness about me. I, I do have a few weeks worth of canned food with me, uh, dried rice, non-perishables, things like that. Uh, I'm not quite as worried about the clean water so, so, so much, simply because I live in a city where we have really, really good access to clean water. But um, I have stocked myself up. I do have some, some Aleve, you know, not naproxen available to myself uh, because I could potentially get infected with this virus. I don't think that that chance is very, very high whatsoever, but it's possible. And if that were to happen, the last thing that I would want would be, you know, being stuck in this apartment for two, three weeks on end without any food or any water, any of that kind of stuff. So uh, it, it is, uh, it's, it's a legitimate concern. Um, it, it's one that definitely has crossed my mind and that I've prepped for. I'm just making sure not to fixate on it. Okay. That cool. Makes sense. All right. Well, I think that's it for today. Uh, thank you so much, Yage, for coming on the show and talking about this stuff. That was that was super interesting and informative. Yeah, that was, I learned a lot. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. It was my pleasure. My Is pleasure. there anything so else much that you want to add before, before we sign off here? Um, I think the really important thing to add for, for all the listeners and all the viewers is we will get through this. We have seen epidemics and pandemics like this in our human history before. We have survived them before as a species. And now it's 2020 where our biomedical technology is through the roof magnitudes better than it was during some of those previous epidemics. So the, the thing to remember is that we will get through this. The human race is stronger than a coronavirus. And, you know, let's just all pray for China. <laughs> Pray for China. That's a great note to end on. Uh, Pray for China. Thanks again, Yage. And uh, audience, hope you found this interesting. Uh, if you want more content like this, like, subscribe. And if you have thoughts on the coronavirus and some of these issues, please leave us some comments. Thank you. Take care. Thanks. Take care.